All right. So next we have Holly Pilson, MD, orthopedic surgeon, Wake Forest Baptist Health. Uh, and I'll stop sharing the screen. Uh, I am so excited because she is my long lost sister. Um, whatever. It's just really, really exciting. So I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give the floor to you, Holly, and we'll talk a little bit afterwards. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully not this one. What, what are you saying? Are you saying my, let me stop sharing. I think I shared the wrong screen. Give me a second. This one. Okay. Can you see that okay? Yes, we can see that okay. Okay, great. I apologize. I um, ran, had to run up from the operating room to make it. So, um, but I'm happy to be here. Um, good afternoon. My name is Holly Pilson. Uh, I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon at Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist, which is in Winston Salem. North Carolina, and um, it's my pleasure to be invited to share this time with you. Um, thank you to Dr. David Lowry and all of your team for, um, for inviting me. So um, today I'm joining, uh, as I said, from the campus of Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist, which is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. That's a picture in the background. So our campuses uh, occupy the ancestral lands of several um, American Indian tribes, the Tutelo, Okaneechee, uh, Kiowi uh, nations primarily, um, as well as some ancestral lands of the Saponi, uh, Catawba, Saura, and Sisipaha nations. Um, in addition to that, North Carolina is home to um, the following indigenous tribes, the Eastern Band of Cherokee, um, Kohari, Halawa Saponi, Lumbee, Maharan, Okaneechee, Band of the Saponi, the Saponi tribe, Tuscarora, and the Wakamasuan, um, in addition to many other individuals belong, who belong to indigenous tribes and nations outside of, uh, of North Carolina. So I just wanted to, uh, to first do that acknowledgement and just enter this time together with respect and, and honor um, for both the original and present day inhabitants of, of this land and, and all the things that we're doing to commit to um, honoring Indigenous sovereignty and elevating um, Indigenous presence and healthcare needs, especially um, in light of our topic today um, and this week. So uh, my journey started here um, in Robinson County, North Carolina, which is the largest county in the state of North Carolina and home to my tribe, uh, the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. Um, so not unlike many Native people who may have grown up on the reservation or in and around Native community, um, I was always growing up in the racial majority in our community. Um, American Indians and Alaskan Natives, uh, predominantly Lumbee, comprise, comprise about 42% of the population in the county in the most recent uh, census. And that has not changed much since I was um, younger. So as such, again, like most um, Native people, I grew up with a very strong sense of self, of pride in being Native and with endless support and encouragement for my family and my community. Um, my grandparents, who you see pictured here, uh, were themselves um, raised as sharecroppers and could not complete a high school education due to family obligations. So they really encouraged not only their children, but their grandchildren, including me, um, to get an education and to, to aim to achieve some of the things and opportunities that they could not. So I'm a direct beneficiary of their hard work and sacrifice and support. So I wanna honor them um, as well as my mom there in the center. Um, additionally, um, my uncle Willie Lowry, who was a well-known um, Lumbee songwriter and playwright, um, he wrote and sang many songs that I remember and hold dear growing up, but the most memorable and meaningful one um, of them was Proud to be a Lumbee Indian that you'll see on this cover here. And so this song framed much of my childhood and really encouraged me um, to aspire to be things that I could have only imagined at the time. Um, so I'm certainly happy and proud of the persistence and beauty and resilience of, of our people, both in the Lumbee tribe and um, indigenous people in general across, across the country. 
Um, little did I know how much I would need to draw on this strong sense of self-worth and pride in my Native identity um, when I moved from being in the racial majority in my home community to being the most underrepresented group in every subsequent community, school environment I found myself in, in my pursuit of, of this career in medicine after I left my home community. Um, so my first wave of sort of culture shock as a Native student outside of my home community started in um, my last two years of high school. I attended a residential magnet school for math and science um, called the School of Science and Math. And um, while I was there, um, I was only one of two Native students in my junior year and then one of three Native students as a senior. Um, interestingly, our mascot, as you can see there, was the unicorn. And um, I don't know um, if there's a more fitting mascot, not only for, for um, the way in which being the only and the sort of the rare breed that I sort of found myself um, feeling in, um, in that way throughout uh, the course of my continued schooling. Um, but it sort of became a part of my identity as being the only or the rare or the smallest number um, throughout the course of my education. Um, so after high school, my post-secondary education started um, at the University of South Carolina, where I majored in exercise science. And then following that, I attended Wake Forest School of Medicine and then completed residency in orthopedic surgery also at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. I then completed uh, an additional year of fellowship training in orthopedic trauma surgery at Sonoran Orthopedic Trauma Surgeons in Scottsdale, Arizona. So medical school really pushed me sort of in, into the fringes in terms of representation. Um, and while I traversed through medical school much earlier than um, the years on this chart, um, you can see that from the most recent cycle, 2021 to 2022, American Indians and Alaskan Natives alone or in combination made up only 1% of total U.S. allopathic matriculants to medical school. And this number drops even further when you look at active U.S. medical residents um, to about 0.3% American Indian Alaska Natives alone or in combination. <clears throat> which when you compare it to the U.S. Census and the U.S. population, it represents um, a magnitude of disparity that approaches 10. So that means that there are nearly 10 times more American Indian and Alaskan Natives in our population than there are U.S. medical residents. Um, or orthopedic surgery for me was always my first choice, my first love in medicine. I certainly entertained other things, but uh, orthopedic surgery was definitely what I always saw myself doing. Um, and I had really no knowledge of just how much this would push me even further into the margins of representation from a race ethnicity perspective. So you can see here um, in the year 2019, American Indian Alaska Natives comprise 0.2% of all active orthopedic surgery residents in the U.S. And then not, a, not just from a race ethnicity standpoint, uh, but also from a gender perspective, um, orthopedic surgery remains the least gender diverse medical specialty in all of medicine, um, with about 7% of practicing orthopedic surgeons being women. So while I love what I do and I find meaningful um, meaning in it in many ways, there, were, there remains a lot of work to be done, both from a race ethnicity standpoint as well as from a gender diversity standpoint. Um, I was interviewed for this stat article back in um, December um, alongside many other um, underrepresented minority orthopedic surgeons. And it was very provocatively titled the whitest specialty. Um, and but is, is actually quite true. And this, this article, article sort of delved into um, a little deeper some of the barriers to promoting diversity in our field. And you know, as the first Native uh, American person from my tribe to be an orthopedic surgeon um, and having never myself met another Native orthopedic surgeon face-to-face, -face, um, you know, what I shared with um, 
with the writers of this article and I'll share with those of you who may be watching this and wondering, well, I'm not native, how do I, how do I support native people? You know, what I share with them is that uh, for most of us who really fall into these, you know, really small groups uh, of underrepresentation in medicine and specialties, um, our mentors and sponsors and advocates are oftentimes not gonna be, they're not gonna look like us, right? So. Like I said, I've never met another native orthopedic surgeon. If I had to wait um, to, you know, some, some people say, you know, you can only be what you can see. Well, I would still be waiting to meet, to meet another um, native orthopedic surgeon. So we depend on allyship and sponsorship and promotion from a, a multitude of different um, people. And so I, I think, you know, being, being an ally is a powerful way to encourage and support and sponsor and advocate on behalf of natives aspiring to careers in medicine, especially um, specialties that are super underrepresented um, racially and eth ethnically. So as a female native orthopedic surgeon, I have benefited from the sponsorship and support and allyship of tons of those who I cannot really relate to from a gender or racial or so socioeconomic um, perspective. Um, and so it's always been my goal to, um, to native uh, as a native woman orthopedic surgeon to, to mentor other um, natives, mentor other women, and to mentor, to mentor really anyone um, who's interested in my field. So this chart represents um, the specialty distribution of American Indian and Alaska native physicians in the US. And um, so what I like to rename this chart is your people need primary care docs because it's really based on a common theme or a common comment I hear repeatedly around recruiting natives and other underrepresented minority groups into medicine. Um, and you can see here that certainly the highest numbers um, represented are the primary care specialties, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, are the three top uh, subspecialties that have the highest number of American Indian Alaska native physicians practicing. Um, surgery is also making, um, is, is, is increasing as well. And then these are also the specialties that are given financial support through Indian Health Service funded scholarships. But, you know, what I would say is that our people need all types of physicians, not just primary care doctors. Um, Native people don't just have diabetes at disproportional rates. Native people don't just have cardiovascular disease at disproportional rates. Um, Native people have lots of medical needs at disproportional rates that don't necessarily fit into the category of management by primary care physicians. So I um, am an orthopedic trauma surgeon, and so that means I take care of um, complex fractures and other bone joint tissue injuries that are normally sustained through traumatic events in adult patients. Um, that means I, I address new fractures that have just occurred. I address non-unions, which are fractures of bones that haven't healed, or malunions, which are fractures of bones that have healed in a um, less than ideal position. Um, and most of my patients come from, the, from these main mechanisms, motor vehicle accidents, motorcycle crashes, falls from significant heights or penetrating injuries such as um, gunshot injury. So I treat, treat a variety of patients in a variety of different locations. Just to take you through some examples, um, uh, I treat fractures of the upper extremity. I treat fractures of the pelvis in adult and pediatric patients, fractures of the hip socket or acetabulum of the femur, just to kind of give you a few examples of some of the injuries that I manage. So, you know, not only, like I said earlier, do American and Alaska Natives suffer disproportionately from a variety of medical conditions, we also suffer disproportionately from traumatic injury. And so this is a study out of Washington State that really speaks to how um, we as American and Alaska Natives suffer disproportionately from traumatic injuries, and that our unintentional injury mortality is two to three times higher than that of non-Hispanic whites. And that in adolescent groups and in groups 20 to 64 years old, um, American Indians and Alaska Natives are hospitalized for injury at higher rates than that of the general population. 
Furthermore, um, what this study actually wanted to and aimed to look at were post-trauma hospital discharge services, meaning rehab and therapy services that are have known benefits, especially um, the more severe the injuries are in a patient. And they wanted to look at, look at you know, what were the differences uh, between American and Alaska Natives and non-Hispanic whites. And so, of course, to no surprise, what they found was that almost 80% of American and Alaska Native people were discharged home without any services, compared to only 62% of non-Hispanic whites. And that was statistically significant. So again, given the known benefits of rehab services and the known barriers that of limited access and community resource, resources for many underrepresented groups, especially American Indians, you know, this is concerning and should contribute to um, um, and can contribute, sorry, to disparities in functional and vocational rehab and other outcomes in, in our uh, people. Another similar study out of North Dakota um, looked at pediatric uh, American Indian and Alaska Native populations. This was published in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. And they showed that American Indian and Alaska Native children are more likely to be referred from outside hospitals to larger level one trauma centers. Um, they're more likely to have penetrating injuries or trauma such as gunshot injuries. And they have a higher likelihood of both minor and major major trauma activation on arrival. And there are um, more American and Alaska Native children suffer violent injuries, require intensive care unit um, stays in the hospital, have prolonged length of stays, and were less likely to, to be dis discharged home. So as you might imagine, whoop, I'm sorry, as you might imagine, um, level one trauma centers, which are the trauma centers that care for um, the, the highest level of acuity in terms of um, injury severity are mainly concentrated in urban areas. So this map shows the counties in North Carolina with the highest American Indian Alaska Native population. And the red stars show the six level one trauma centers in our state. So you can see that um, the closest level one trauma center for many of our American Indian uh, communities uh, can be up to four hour drive away, um, which means that many American Indian uh, people in our state who are already more disproportionately affected by trauma have problems with access, family support and resources while they are admitted to our trauma centers and very likely uh, limited post discharge resources as well as we saw in um, the last two articles. So as an American Indian surgeon in a level one trauma center, um, that sees not an insignificant amount of American Indian patients each year. You know, I see it as a part of my responsibility to help educate, um, advocate, and help cultivate an environment here um, that is culturally competent, welcoming, and providing the highest level of care um, to our American Indian population that um, is the uh, unfortunate res um, uh, recipient of a, of a traumatic injury. So we spoke a little bit earlier about um, American Indian Alaska Native disparities among medical students and residents. But I also just wanted to end um, with what I think is an even more staggering figure that I think is so important for us to consider as we work towards health equity in Native America. So we mentioned that 1% of US medical students in allopathic medical schools are American Indian Alaska Native. Then 0.3% we mentioned of medical residents, active medical residents are American Indian Alaska Native. But American Indian and Alaska Natives make up only 0.0015% of all US medical school faculty. That's not 1.5%, that's not 15%, it's 0.0015% of all US medical school faculty are American Indian and Alaska Natives. So US medical school faculty are really the gatekeepers. They're the decision makers. They're the policy influencers at our institutions. They are the ones that help frame discussions and metrics and guidelines and strategies for how we recruit, how we retain, how we uh, make sure our curriculum is culturally competent 
how we care for patients. Um, and so not only do our people need primary care doctors, and not only do our people need subspecialty doctors, our people need doctors in positions of influence. And uh, I've had a lot of full circle moments in my career. And one of the biggest being returning to Wake Forest um, as an academic faculty member and becoming involved in many um, committees and processes, including the Committee for Admissions for a Medical School, um, where I can really understand more and appreciate this need and what we can do um, to continue to think strategically about really moving the needle in terms of health equity in Native America. I think we need to be thinking more broadly outside of the more traditional boxes we've been accustomed to and working towards encouraging and supporting and elevating uh, Native voices in all of these spaces and spheres um, of influence and especially where we can really um, have the, the greatest impact in academic medicine. So that is all I have. Um, I'm happy to entertain any questions and I'm gonna actually stop sharing so I can actually see you all. Unmute, unmute, unmute. Thank you, Dr. Pilsen for <laughs> joining us today. Um, you know, I can say you definitely were a mentor for me um, when I started my medical journey and we continue to um, be supportive of each other. So um, we continue to support you and look forward to seeing what you do in the future. Um, and I do have a message that I will send to you after this from Nicole Stern, who's at Harvard and um, she just wants to connect with you. So I have her email and I'll be um, sharing that with you. Great, right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so Nina has, um, posted, this is just a general comment, um, she would like to recommend uh, the book called God is Red, A Native View of Religion by Vine Deloria, um, and so, um, that is a book that, uh, that others can look into. And Rochelle asks, do you have a definition of health equity that you use or prefer? Is that for me? Sorry. Yeah, that's for you. Do I have a definition of health equity that I use or I prefer? That's a great question. Um, I, I can't say there's one I like a, a go to definition. Uh, there's certainly. Um, you know, a lot that goes into health equity and certainly for, for some it's very individual, you know, some, some it's very population specific or group specific. Um, and, you know, I guess when I think of health, health equity and what I do and the patients that I treat and, um, you know, I always say that, I always tell um, people trauma is a great equalizer, right? Trauma happens to everyone from every walk of life, every age group, every socioeconomic status, every race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, and so I, you know, really like to get to know my patients. I really like to figure out what their specific needs are. Um, there are a lot of patients that, you know, because you can't plan for trauma, like you can plan for your diabetes medication or plan for your elective surgeries. Um, there's a lot of people that find themselves in situations where they're not really financially able to support themselves while they're recovering. Um, there's people that are not able to support their families, some people that can't afford food. You know, there's lots of, situ so lots of subtle um, things that you wouldn't know about unless you really get to know your patients and talk to them and say, you know, I realize this is extremely disruptive to your life, this traumatic situation you've been in. Um, help me understand what your resources are. Help me understand what your needs are. Help, help us understand how we can help you not only just recover for yourself, but for your family and your community and all the things you need to return to. And that's such a specific and nuanced thing for even, even at the individual level, right? So I think just taking it down to the individual patient level and getting to know your patients and figuring out where you can meet them and how, um, you know, what different things you need to do for them that might be not necessarily equal to the next patient, but equitable for what their injuries and recovery and social situations are that that need um, you know maybe a little bit different approach. Wow, yeah, I don't think that I got that when I was going through my journey of back surgery. I don't think any physician kind of considered 
all the other changes in my life that, you know, six years later, I'm still having to deal with. So, um, yeah, I'll give you an example. I saw a patient in clinic yesterday and the patient was referred to me with a fracture. Um, and it had been about two weeks since she sustained this fracture and it needed to have, it needs a surgery to fix it. Um, and, um, I, I could have approached it and said, I have, I have a surgery day tomorrow. I'm going to set you up. We're going to get you taken care of. It's going to be great. We'll get you in, do your surgery. You'll go home the next day. Bada bing, bada boom. And in some, in some, um, standards that might have been perceived as, wow, they really got me in there. They got me in there fast, et cetera. But I, as I began to talk to her about what happened and her injuries and what she needed, um, I, I began to uncover a lot of things that were super complex. She was a primary caretaker for her husband who has type one diabetes and is on nighttime peritoneal dialysis, who all also, by the way, just had a four vessel um, bypass surgery last week and just returned home from that procedure yesterday. In addition to that, she has two adult special needs sons at home. And so as I began to sort of discuss with her what she needed, I began to uncover all the other things that she needed to, to take care of and help with her family. And so as we discussed, you know, op options and all the things that she had going on and would it be feasible for us to do it Friday instead of today, you know, we sort of just have to meet our patients where they were, where they are, um, and kind of come to an agree, agreed upon compromise. That's what, what is best for them. And so we decided that, you know, today wasn't the best time for her to have surgery. Friday's the best time for her to have surgery so that she can go home and she can get her family spirit away and figure out things um, before coming back. So, so, I mean, I think it does require that level of sometimes asking like, what is best for you and, you know, how can we help do this so it doesn't um, totally, it's not, you know, more disruptive to your life than it already has been and things of that sort. So we um, do have another question for you. Um, so on Monday, um, we learned that um, there's even more of a discrepancy in the number of medical students on the East Coast versus the West Coast in medical schools. And so the question is asking, how do you recruit Native medical students in the East Coast and where there, there are also low numbers of Native students going into medicine? So what are some things you would recommend for recruiting those students? Yeah, um, I did not know about that discrepancy East versus West Coast, but that's interesting. Um, so I think certainly things that we've done, social media is a big, um, is a big driver of recruitment across the board. Um, it's easy. It's especially in this generation of students that are um, pursuing medicine. Most, most of them are on social media. It's an easy way to sort of touch, um, make touch points in the community and with folks that you may never be able to meet in person. Um, recruitment fairs at undergraduate institutions that ha have a large population of American Indian, Indian Alaska Native students. Um, attending um, the um, uh, Association for Native American Medical Students Conference, which coincides with um, the Association of American Indian Physicians Conference. Um, last year we attended that, but it was virtual. And so um, that is certainly a great way to connect with Native students. Um, and, um, you know, webinars are easy. We, we definitely had a lot of webinars, not specifically uh, geared towards Native students only, but, um, you know, all students are welcome to attend where you can sort of introduce your, your um, school or your department or your program on a, on a virtual basis, just like we are doing right now, um, and, and really introduce them to what different types of things that you're doing um, to to make your program in your school more um, appealing to, to a Native person. Yeah. All right. So um, someone mentioned that uh, you're absolutely correct and that we need more subspecialty Native physicians, but with the IHS and National Health Service Corps scholarships, we'll only fund primary care and a structural barrier, therefore, we need more advocates to change these rules and regulations so all Native medical students, residents are supported. I'd also like to add to that, that, you know, that discrepancy between federally recognized versus state recognized tribes also sometimes 
can get in the way of um, admissions um, requirements. So that too, I feel personally um, should be reconsidered. Um, so yeah, so um, Holly, you've done such a great job um, right now. We don't have any other questions for you, but um, you know, Holly and I were at med school at the same time. We were, I think, the only two at the at the school. So um, we definitely had to support each other. And um, I think that it would be better if the schools themselves knew how to support Native students, like we discussed on Monday. And I think that we have a lot to learn um, from the Oklahoma school and how they've set up a lot of those support systems. So yeah, they're changing. <laughs> Can I ask a question based on that real, real quick, Holly? Um, while I was teaching medical humanities in Chicago, many of my conversations were around who writes MCATs, who writes US MLE step one, two, three. Um, can you just briefly tap into that a bit? Why would it be important for Native people to help co-author those exams? The questions themselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, in many ways, those are the filters or the gateways through which medicine happens, right? So, yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I, I think Native people need to be included in the conversation and the discussions at all those levels. Um, but with the, the issue is that with so few, um, you know, there's only so many of us, and um, you know, I'm sure you, you all have heard of sort of the minority tax, minority burden, we often get asked to do a lot. Mm. And sometimes the asks are not uh, necessarily things that um, easily fit into the promotion algorithm for your, your institution or um, easily fit into metrics that you can use to advance, your, advance yourself, right? We, we, do, we spend a lot of time serving, a lot of, a lot of committee work, a lot of um, helping look through curriculum and questions and things to make sure they're culturally competent and appropriate or addressing concerns or issues that have come up, statements, comments, all the, all the things. And so, you know, with the, with the low numbers of us, it can get really, it can really burn you out. It can get really burdensome. Um, you feel like you carry a lot of weight um, and responsibility, but, but because there's so few of us, you also feel an obligation, right? You feel a responsibility. You feel like if, you know, well, uh, knowing that the numbers are so low, especially in academic medicine, like if, if I don't speak up, if I don't volunteer, if I don't say absolutely, I'm willing to make, make sure we look at our curriculum, make sure it's culturally competent, um, then who else will, right? And, and if you stand by, you definitely see the times where, wow, they really should have had a Native person look at that picture, or they really should have had a Native person read that question and pick up on some of the, you know, the bias that a non-native person couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's, it is really important, but I really um, hope that we can do a better job recruiting native people into academic medicine and underrepresented minorities in general in academic medicine, because there's, um, you know, there, there are fantastic allies, um, but the work that there, there's a lot of work to do, and there's not a lot of people doing it, and it, and it can burn, it can give, give you burnout. Um, so, in, in terms of the question writing, I don't write any questions for MCAT or USMLE, and I don't even know how you get selected to do that. <laughs> Which, which I'm glad. Which I'm glad you're saying that because I think a lot of people just don't understand how that process. Works. Yeah, yeah. So there are physicians. There are you know the, the different licensing exams. So for example, I do know people who write for the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery questions. I do know question writers for that exam, and um, people are chosen um, and they you know submit questions based on their specific specialty area that's typically linked to articles or book chapters or things that um, are expected that, um, that trainees will have read on that topic. Um, but I've never been involved in that process, so I don't know that I can speak exactly to, um, to what all goes into that or how they select. But, but certainly I think the more of a diverse body of question writers that you have that can not only contribute questions, but look at all the questions and think, ah, uh, I'm not sure that's a really a great way we should ask that. Or, or when I read this question, this is what I think coming from my perspective, like maybe we should reframe that or think about 
the ways in which different learners might look at that question and think something differently than what you're trying to ask. So, Yeah, because uh, very quickly, because I think a lot of what you're saying, a lot of what we're talking about here connects all the speakers today, language, psychological perspective, um, you know, the things that really we're talking about inviting us into the room, but also having us orient the room, you know, how do we speak? How do we think? And how is that inflected or placed or injected into things that are very official tests, institutions, so on and so forth. We have one last question for you, Holly. Um, a person wants to know what keeps you going in the midst of such challenging stats? Um, I love what I do first and foremost. Um, I think if I didn't love what I did, it would be really hard. Um, but I, you know, just like you said, Nicole, I, you know, we all get asked questions uh, in a multitude of different ways um, regarding identity, what you are, who you are. I've never met a Native person before. You guys still exist. You know, all the questions that we get, I um, try, as you said, to turn them into educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that, you know, there are some people that have mal malintent, but I think for the most part, people are just ignorant and they just don't know. And so I have turned many conversations into educational opportunities that I feel like have really um, been able to leverage good, solid relation working relationships with people um, that I feel like if I had turned it instead into, um, you know, um, resentment or bitterness or, you know, things of that sort uh, would not have worked out well. And so I think for me, it's just a passion for what I do, a passion to see improvement, a passion to move the needle, um, a passion to, you know, treat patients equitable and um, the best that I can and to improve orthopedic care for not just our communities, but every community that I serve. Um, and, and I think it's just a commitment also to all the, the dedication and sacrifice that my ancestors have made to make sure that I can stand where I stand mm -hmm. and to make sure that I can continue to open the door as others open the door for me and, and hold the door open for those people um, that are coming behind me and show them, you know, the way that I didn't really have anyone to show me. Um, I want to make sure I can do that for someone else. So I think that's what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. I love that answer. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank I'm you gonna, for joining us. And yeah, I really appreciate you guys. I'm going to have to run back to the hours. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um,